We are then called to teach it. We are called to teach it, especially to the next generation. And I think it's important for us to understand that we can't leave this teaching to someone else. I'm thankful for the church programs that we have here and that other churches offer. Those are wonderful opportunities and I encourage you to take advantage of them as, as best you can and as often as you can. I'm thankful for things like Christian schools that, that give students a perspective of learning from coming from Scripture. But the primary responsibility for teaching Scripture comes from parents and those who are closest to children and to the next generation. And remember, this message is clear. The gospel message is clear. You don't need to be a professional educator in order to teach what's in Scripture. And so as we look a little bit more closely at our text, as we're called to teach, I want to say a couple things about how we are called to teach. The first thing is that we are called to teach diligently. Verse 7, in another version, the ESV, says, You shall teach them diligently, teach these commands, diligently to your children. And so let's think about diligently in a couple ways. The first is, as it might be defined, and that you would teach it repeatedly, that you would be diligent in your teaching, that you would do it again and again and again. Now, if you're an athlete, you understand how this works, right? You don't get it right the first time. You don't fully understand it the first time. If you're a, a baseball player, you're not going to throw a no-hitter the first time you throw a baseball. If you're a, a tennis player, you're not going to win your first match, six love, six love. Well, maybe if you're playing your baby brother or something, but I mean, you're probably not going to win the first time out. If you're a golfer, chances are you're not going to hit a hole in one the first time. You need to be coached again and again and again, and you need to be reminded of proper techniques and, and the way to, to hit a ball or to throw it, whatever you might be doing. You understand that. If you're a musician, you understand the same thing. The first piece that you play isn't going to be Mozart. Your first solo isn't going to sound like Taylor Swift or Frank Sinatra. Right? I mean, you have to practice, you have to be coached again and again and again before you have some mastery over what you are doing. And so the text tells us to teach our children again and again and again. Don't think you've ever done it too much. We are called to teach diligently, to do it repeatedly, to do it with a purpose. We're also, the second aspect then of diligently is to just look at the second half of the word, right? Now, this isn't probably the best word definition I've ever done, but gently, right, is how that word ends. And I think that's an important thing for us to think about as well as we teach. Gentleness, rather than browbeating, will make it more likely that that instruction is going to be received. You know, the old saying goes something like this, you know, you catch more flies with honey than vinegar. And so the idea is as we're teaching, we're doing it diligently, we're doing it repeatedly with a purpose again and again and again, but we're also doing it gently. 1 Peter 3.15 says this, But in your hearts revere Christ as Lord, Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. In other words, be ready to teach, right? But do this with gentleness and respect. I think that's such a key piece in how we handle Scripture. We handle it in a way that we teach and teach and teach, but we do it with gentleness and respect. So we teach diligently. A second way that we can teach, um, I'll call it this way, is to teach experientially. And this text from Deuteronomy 6 is all about teaching experientially. What does it say? It doesn't say sit your child down and lecture at him or her for an hour, right? It says um, impress them on your children 
Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. So one of the ways that the Jewish people have um, lived into this text is through something called a mezuzah. Um, it hangs on the doorpost. We actually have one in our house as well that we got when we were in Israel. And it literally is um, posted right there on, on the door frame, and um, you touch it um, on your way out as a reminder of, of God's word. And, and oftentimes a mezuzah will have, that's the Hebrew letter, one of the Hebrew letters S, um, which stands for the Shema, which is Hebrew 6, 4, and 5. And so those words are often on a tiny little scroll inside the mezuzah, and so when you touch it, you're reminded to love the Lord your God, and that you are also instructed to teach your children about loving the Lord your God. There were other things that the Jewish people did as well. They literally would bind it to their forehead. They would do other things just to live into that and to teach it experientially. No, we don't do some of those things today, but maybe we do. What you see on the picture on the left is that maybe somewhere in your house you have scripture hanging on the wall. Maybe it's a, a decal on the wall, maybe it's a poster, maybe it's a, a beautiful framed picture, whatever it is. But we put those words in our houses so that we have the words of scripture in front of us. It becomes an experience. So maybe you might have that in your living room. Maybe you have it on a bathroom mirror. Maybe you have it on the dash of your car. Maybe you have it on the, the cubicle where you work. Maybe you have it in your study carol in the library. Wherever you are, put God's word so that you can see it and be reminded of it. But I think above all, the best way to teach experientially is to allow others to see you living it out. There is no greater way to pass along the words of Scripture than for others to see you living it out. And so maybe that's through a devotional time that you have at home with your family. Maybe it's just in the, the way that people see you interacting with other people. Maybe it's the attitudes that they notice from you, the words that you speak. Whatever it is, the best way to teach the word experientially is to live it out and to allow others to see you living it out. Now that doesn't mean that you go and you boast about how you live. It just means that you are humbly living your life in a way that reflects God's word and allows others to see how God's word transforms our lives. And so this teaching of scripture is clear and it is teachable. We can teach it through our words. We can teach it through our lives. We can teach it in a way that we experience it in our senses. And so since the Bible is clear, and since we're called to teach it, then we need some methods to help us to hear and to understand that message so that we can pass it along. And so the practice that we're going to talk about today is to probe Scripture. And it's a series of nine questions. I didn't come up with these questions. These come from Rick Warren. You may have heard of him. He's pastor of a large church in Southern California. And he has come up with these nine questions for us to probe Scripture. Now, these nine questions are great. I'm sharing them with you today. But above all, what I want you to think about is what are the questions that I need to ask when I'm coming to Scripture? And so if these questions trigger others in your mind, great. If these are the only nine questions you use, great. So let me just give those to you, and I'll use our text from Deuteronomy 6 to, to work through this. So the, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Um, when I was in seminary, um, I was given a method of how to handle Scripture, and we used the, the word probe, and it had these uh, five words attached to it. Pray, read, observe, believe, and explain. And again, I think that's a, it's a good method when we come to Scripture. We want to pray over it before we read it. We want to, then we read it, we observe. We talked about that last week in terms of picture. We want to believe what's in Scripture, and then we get to the point where we're ready to explain it or to pass it along. All right, let's get to those questions. The first one is this. Is there a sin to confess? 
And so if we're reading Deuteronomy 6, and I'm asking that question, is there a sin to confess? Um, it could be the case, and likely is at multiple times, that I have failed to put God first. Right? Love the Lord your God. Love God above all. Perhaps, and even in that moment, I have failed to put God first. And so there's a sin that I need to confess as I read these words. We're going to go through these pretty quickly. Is there a promise to claim? Well, God is revealing himself in this text. God is saying that uh, uh, love the Lord, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. There's a promise that he is our God and that he is the only God. And that's the promise that we claim. A third, the third question is this. Is there an attitude to change? And so as I read this text, maybe I come to the realization that I haven't fully live for God, and that attitude needs to change within me, that I need to fully live every day for God. The next question, is there a command to obey? Well, it's pretty clear in this text, right? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. We sometimes call this the great commandment. And so, yes, there's a command here that we are called to obey. And as Jesus was asked about the greatest commandment, he added that a second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. Next question, is there an example to follow? Sometimes we might look at the characters of Scripture and say, well, I, I need to have faith like Gideon, or I need to have um, the boldness of Paul. And while that's not always the main message that we want to get out of a text, Sometimes there are examples to follow. In this text, there isn't a particular character that we're focusing on here. These are, um, Moses is speaking to the people on behalf of God. And so what's the example to follow? Well, we're called to follow the example of our parents, of those who have led us in the faith. Um, is there a prayer to pray? Is the next question. And as we read a text like Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9, we might come to the point of saying, you know, um, God, help me to love you with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my strength. And give me the courage to pass on the faith that you have given me. It leads us to a prayer to God. Another question, is there an error to avoid? So some texts talk about our behavior. We read some earlier in worship today. Um, as far as this text goes, is there an error to avoid? Maybe the error is that we feel inadequate in passing along the faith, that we just don't know it well enough to pass it along. And we need to get beyond that wrong thinking and say, no, this message of Scripture is clear, and I am called by God to pass that along. Question eight, is there a truth to believe? Well, the truth that we hear in this text, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. There is one God. He reveals himself as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so that's a truth that we can believe from this text. And then the last question, is there something to praise God for? Well, in this text, I think one of the things that we can praise God for is the faith to believe. The faith to put our trust in him and to live every day for him. The faith to, to pass this on from generation to generation and to see faith taking hold in, in the next generation as well. All things that, that we can give praise to God for as we read this text. And so let me just end with this question. It's simply this. What text will I probe this week? Um, online is our Beyond Sunday resource. You can find that on our worship resources webpage, and you can um, download that document. Um, it lists the nine questions on there, and then has six different uh, scripture texts that you can look at. If you do those, one of those six, great. If you do a different one, that's fine too. But I think it's important for us to just dig into scripture, to ask those questions as we come to God's word. Because if we're not asking the questions, perhaps we're missing the message. A message that's clear. But it doesn't mean that it's just going to pop out of the page at us. It's a message that God gives us minds to understand and questions to ask and to lead us into that. And so be blessed as you probe God's word this week. Would you pray with me? 
Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for its clear message. We thank you for the good news of the gospel. And we thank you for minds that can read and understand. And we pray, Lord, that you would use these questions or others that you bring to our minds to probe into your word, to learn what you have to teach us, to learn how you are challenging us, to be reminded of promises, to be corrected in our behavior and our attitudes, and to give praise to you. Lord, we thank you for the good gift of your word and for its power to change us and to change our world. Grant us your blessing as we probe your word this week. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As we end worship today, we end singing praise to God, declaring the goodness of God. Let's sing together.
May it be that that's our testimony, that that's the message that we pass on, the goodness of God as he reveals himself to us in his word, as he has reached out to us through Jesus Christ, his son. As we go into this week, know that God goes with you and he sends you with his blessing. Please receive that blessing today. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. Amen and amen. Go in peace. Thank you.